the line with us is the author of a, a, a fascinating new book, Robert P. Jones, the president and founder of the Public Religion Research Institute. Uh, his new book is The Hidden History of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future. Uh, he also has a Substack newsletter. It's uh, whitetolong.net. W-H-I-T-E-T-O-O-L-O-N-G.net is, uh, is the website. Or just go to substack.com and type in white too long or Robert P. Jones and it'll pop up. Um, Robert P. Jones is his Twitter handle. Uh, Robert, welcome to the program. I, I'm, I'm uh, going to ask you to kind of hold my hand here because it normally... Uh, one of the things that makes me crazy as an author myself is when I'm being interviewed by somebody who has not read my book, although that's probably 90% of the interviews that I end up doing, uh, you know, with or that I, you know, where people are interviewing me. Um, and I have not received your book from your publicist yet. We, we were hoping to get it before we did this, so I haven't had a chance to go through it. So I'm going to have to ask you to kind of walk me through it. Uh, the, first of all, let's start with the premise of the book. You want to lay that out for us? Sure. No apologies for that, uh, but I will. Yeah, we'll, we'll walk through it. Um, so, uh, you know, the, yeah, the book is uh, the hidden roots of white supremacy and the past of shared American future. And uh, I basically take uh, am looking to to trace this entanglement of kind of white supremacy and American democracy back to its back to its roots. Um, uh, so I am looking back, and I, I trace it back really to 1493. So not 1776. Not even 1619, uh, but even further back uh, to 1493. Christopher Columbus. Uh, yeah, and you know what's significant about that? It's, it's not 1492, you know, the year that we all learned that Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue, uh, but it's 1493 because that's the year that he actually goes back after encountering uh, these undiscovered lands, uh, quote unquote, uh, and undiscovered people, uh, and he is getting permission uh, and authority. Uh, to go back with more soldiers, more missionaries, um, and to claim these lands, um, you know, for, for Spain and, and for the Christian church. And one of the places he goes to get that authority is not only uh, Ferdinand and Isabella, but he goes to uh, the head of the Christian church, uh, who issues um, a document that became part of what's now known as the Doctrine of Discovery, um, that essentially says, look, if you have encountered any non-Christian people, and that's the critical um, uh, designation. If you encounter any non-Christian people um, occupying lands, then you have the permission of uh, the, the and blessing of the church to occupy those lands, to steal their goods. Uh, and even this language is in the document. This is a document, you know, hit, issued uh, from the head of the Christian church um, at the time that says, and to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery. Like that is actually in wow. uh, the document that um, that uh, that Columbus receives from the Christian church. Uh, and so I'm a religion scholar uh, by training, and I have to confess, like um, even before doing the deep research on this book, this was not something that I had, um, you know, in my repertoire as something significant for how the dial was set for the entanglement of religion, white supremacy, um, and its relationship to, to democracy um, in this country. Yeah, I the the uh, I, you know I'm familiar with the doctrine doctrine of discovery and and you know that moment in time and all that, but I I did not recall. Now I now I remember now that you reminded me that that particular phrase was in there. So, and and Columbus, I mean, you know, I, uh, Columbus wrote at at actually it was Miguel Cueno, I believe it's pronounced, uh, his uh, right hand guy. You know, wrote quite a few letters back and diaries about. Uh, Columbus trying to do the the slave uh, uh, routine and how the Indians resisted being enslaved and how uh, Indian women would uh, commit suicide rather than give childbirth uh, rather than mm. you know do childbirth um, and and a bunch and eventually his brother uh, Bartholomew Columbus you know uh, did the census over a, about a decade there and 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 uh, documented basically the extinction of the Taino people at least in in what we now call Haiti. Um, so, or the Dominican Republic. I mean, you know, the where where he first landed. What, what does this? Where do you go from there in, in with your book? How, how does how does this set the stage for, for example, the the genocide of Native Americans and the introduction of slavery into North America? Yeah. Well, one of the things I'm trying to do in the book is is actually to hold these things together, to hold together the history of African Americans in this country, the history of Indigenous people in this country. And the really the connective tissue in the through line is European encounters and the relationship between people of European descent 
um, and, and those people. Um, these are, in American history, I think often told in siloed ways. We have African American history, we have uh, Native American history, but we, we often don't see these things um, together in one story. So one of the ways I do it is I, um, I tell the story through three communities. So one in Mississippi, one in Minnesota, one in Oklahoma, um, three very different areas of the country with very different histories, but try to connect up um, you know, these histories together. And what we, what we really see is that, um, you know, again, we, we may know generally about the genocide and forced migration of Native Americans um, on the Trail of Tears. We certainly know about um, and, and have come more front and center in the last few years as a result of the Black Lives Matter movement, the history of, uh, you know, the enslavement um, and, and later uh, uh, segregation, oppression of African Americans um, in this country. But we often, again, don't see these things together. Um, so, you know, in Mississippi, I'm from Mississippi. I, I tell the story um, of, of Emmett Till, um, but against the backdrop of uh, the story of indigenous people in the country. And that, you know, you really do see this connection, if, especially if you ask the question, how do we get a society um, you know, where uh, two men uh, murder a 14-year-old African-American boy who's down visiting his relatives uh, in, in Mississippi uh, simply for whistling um, at a white woman who torture him and kill him and then, and then are acquitted uh, within a matter of an hour um, by a jury of all white, all, all white men and then later confess to the crime. Like, how do we get a society uh, that's like that? And, you know, I think we often uh, kind of uh, you know, hold our hands up and say, like, yeah, I, I can't understand it. But when you really see that the same motivations uh, for uh, setting up Jim Crow South would go backwards to crushing Reconstruction, to the Confederacy, to the enslavement of African Americans, and then even before that, uh, you know, to uh, genocide and forced removal of Native Americans from those lands, through line of all of that is this idea that really does stem from the doctrine of discovery from the 15th century and is this basic idea that's still with us today that uh, the belief that these lands were guaranteed by God and designated by God to be a kind of promised land uh, for European Christians. And if you really believe that, um, then, you know, uh, the whole colonial project, the whole uh, enslavement project uh, fits um, in, into that worldview. Uh, and still today, there's the sense that, you know, this, that is who this country is for. It's for white Christian people. And yet, most black people in the United States right now are Christian or identify as Christian. Um, is, is, so you're, I, it sounds like you know, the original argument in, the, in 1493 was it's all about being Catholic or at least being Christian. It's all about religion. But now the argument is it's really all about race. Do I have that right? Well, you know, not exactly. I mean, if you listen to, um, you know, uh, Trump and, and look at his 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 base, right? His base is a very religious base. It's a white Christian mm -hmm. base. The Republican Party today, for example, is 70 percent white and Christian. Uh, that's in a country that's only 42 percent white. I'm, and I'm Christian, surprised it's right? that low at 70 percent. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, but, you know, the Democratic Party is only about a third. Uh, yeah. White and Christians, and and so when you and when you hear language like you know the MAGA mantra, "Make America Great Again," you know the most powerful word is always that last word again, that nostalgia yeah. for. Uh, and if you hear him saying things like, "If you don't vote for me, we're not going to have a country anymore," right? What does he mean by that? Who's the we um, in in that thing? And and it is about race, but it's always in, in the American context been an ethno-religious cultural identity. So even the KKK, for example. Um, was a white Christian movement. Um, right. You know, it wasn't just uh, against African Americans. And, and the reason why the KKK opposed Catholics and Jews uh, and persecuted Catholics and Jews is because they weren't Protestant and Christian. Right. So this white Anglo-Saxon Christian version uh, of, of America, I think, is really the through line. Uh, you, you, the first story you tell is the story of Mississippi. The second story you tell is uh, Minnesota, uh, part two, Duluth. Uh, tell us about that. Right. Well, you know, I want to make sure uh, if I'm telling a story about kind of the entanglement of white supremacy, Christianity um, and its relationship to our, our history, uh, I wasn't just picking on a state in the South, like my home state of Mississippi, or even a, a very red state, you know, like Oklahoma, uh, where every county, for example, voted for Donald Trump in the last election. But the Minnesota, right, um, right up next to Canada and very far north. Um, and there's a story I think not many people know um, uh, that, you know, even in a place like Minnesota, we have 
this horrific history of, of race-based lynching. Um, so um, I start with a story in, in 1920 of um, three African-American circus workers who were in town for a single day. Uh, they were falsely accused uh, by a white woman of, um, of sexually assaulting her um, and were rounded up by the police, put in jail, and uh, then torn out of jail by a huge mob. Uh, and three of them were lynched on the, um, uh, on the town square, um, uh, right downtown. And uh, what's notable about this is that um, it was a huge, huge mob. There were 10,000 people estimated Whoa. who turned out uh, for this lynching in this, you know, you know, we think of the very white, you know, area of the country or very few African-Americans there. Um, think of it off of, you know, you think of like Minnesota nice and it's far above, you know, and outside of the Mason-Dixon line and uh, those kind of policies we typically can think of. But that was a, at the time about a tenth of the population of the town. Uh, that turned out uh, for, for this for this lynching, um, and, and then there was this kind of conspiracy of silence um, that was set up. They didn't talk about it, um, uh, you know, until there was a group of people, um, at, at kind of around 2000, that began, uh, actually in the 1990s, that began saying, you know, we really need to tell the truth um, about this part of the history of our town. Um, and it was a a, a, a white woman, um, African American man, and a Latina. A woman who got together and started gathering people um, around and eventually um, set up this entire plaza in downtown Duluth. It's a beautiful uh, plaza that has images of the three men and then these quotes about uh, the need to tell the truth and about racial healing and and, um, and repair uh, there. And uh, this was done in 2003. So it's one of the first uh, communities to really tell the story of a lynching publicly and to set up a memorial uh, to the victims of lynching uh, in the country. And what's notable about that is that because it was set up so far uh, ahead of time before the Black Lives Matter movement is the is, is the way it functioned uh, there is that it actually functioned as a, a kind of peaceful gathering place uh, for people who were protesting. Uh, and the other through line here that I think is is kind of tells you about the legacy of, of these efforts of truth telling is that the police chief in, in Duluth um, uh, was actually related. Uh, to the woman who falsely accused um, the, these men uh, two generations back. Um, and he only came to know that story about his own family because there had been such silence because of this memorial effort that happened about 20 years ago. But he, he was part of that story. Um, and so when Black Lives Matter um, protests are happening, it actually shaped the way that he did policing um, huh. in the country, in, in the city, um, and that he, he was like, look, we need to make sure there's a safe place for people to protest even though they don't have a permit and i think it was a model of not over policing um you know and kind of giving people the space uh, keeping everybody safe but giving them space and not being overly aggressive and and also because duluth had a place yeah. for people to gather uh, around this idea of, of reckoning truth telling and um and healing welcome back we're talking with robert p jones about his new book the hidden roots of white supremacy and the path to a shared american future WhiteTooLong.net is the uh, website for his uh, Substack uh, on this topic and others. And uh, Robert, let's let's get to the uh, you know in the uh, uh, probably four minutes we have left here, um, get to the 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 good stuff here, <laughs> the shared the path to a shared American future. How do we recover from 400, uh, 500 years of of institutionalized white and Christian supremacy? Well, it's it's a challenge uh, to be sure. Um, again, where I found hope, though, is in these local efforts um, on the ground. You know, if you only look at the headlines, I think um, you know it, it, it that we hear from the kind of mainstream media, it looks a little hopeless. Um, but you know, when I spent time on the ground again, and and not in you know bastions of liberalism, in, in places like Mississippi, Oklahoma, um, you know, there are these efforts at local truth telling on the ground that are actually changing the local landscape, right? So 20 years ago, there was nothing on the ground in Tallahatchie County, Mississippi, commemorating Emmett Till. Today, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, President Biden uh, uh, announced a new national monument to Emmett Till and Mamie Till Mobley that's gonna be located jointly in Chicago uh, and Mississippi. 20 years ago, there was nothing in Duluth, Minnesota, uh, telling uh, the truth um, about a lynching that happened there. Uh, and until just a few years ago, there, there really wasn't a, a major uh, recognition of one of the worst acts of racial violence we've had in the country um, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, but a group of citizens got together, um, again, even in a very conservative state like, like Tulsa, and said, no, we're going to tell the truth. Now, to be sure, there's this huge backlash 
uh, in the country, it's kind of backlash against so-called critical race theory, efforts to ban books, uh, et cetera. But I think those are, in fact, uh, rather desperate uh, efforts to push back against what is actually progress uh, and, and, a, and a real willingness of Americans to begin to reckon with this history, to try to tell the truth, and to do it, really, with an eye toward uh, building a better future together. So uh, institutions, organizations, I mean, what, what role does politics have in this? What role do various yeah. institutions and organizations have in this? What, where can the average you know, person have the greatest impact in trying to bring about this positive future that you're envisioning? Yeah, I mean, I think these all started with local efforts. So that's what's remarkable with very few resources um, mm -hmm. in, in every instance. They, it's a handful of people, really neighbors, got mm -hmm. together and said, you know, we need to tell the truth. We need to get involved. Uh, they began to gather other people around them. And then at certain moments, uh, they, we did have local government step in and provide support all the way up to the federal, like I said, with the National Park Service. Um, but, but the beginning of this really was neighbors coming together and saying, look, um, we, we can't really have a better future if we haven't told the truth about our, about our past. We want to kind of heal uh, the racial divisions in our community. And we're going to start with something very simple and, and on the ground uh, and something that's local that, that you know, we, we can tell the story about what, what's here. And, and that was really the beginning. And uh, that, I think, gives me some hope because, again, these weren't well-funded, uh, top-down efforts. These were really people who asked their neighbors to get involved and make some changes on the ground. And yet you've got uh, Ron DeSantis and, and others now, you know, several uh, right-wing governors, Republican governors, are not only purging black history out of their classrooms, they're, they're bringing in Prager U uh, to teach, you know, a, a revisionist white supremacist history. Yeah, that's right. And certainly that Prager U um, curriculum, I mean, has uh, literally the doctrine of discovery as a good thing, uh, right? right? Um, this kind of idea of um, kind of Christian supremacy built into that curriculum. Uh, but again, I do think that this is a reaction on the part of Santa's uh, and Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, the public schools there uh, as well, Arkansas, uh, ban ban are saying they won't give credit for AP African American history. These are all, I think, reactionary efforts to the waking up and the reckoning that it's actually happening um, on the ground in the country and the changing demographics in the country. As I so said, the, I mean, these are know, arguably good signs. I, I do think that it's it's ugly and it's going to, you know, we should buckle up. It's going to be tough, a tough ride, I think, for the next few years. But I think it's because we are at a turning point uh, in our nation's history uh, that is about kind of reckoning. And I'm, I'm hopeful um, uh, that will finally get us to, um, you know, what I call in the book, a shared path um, uh, to a better American future. Yeah. We have about 25 seconds. It seems to me that uh, the election of uh, Barack Obama kind of broke the bra brains of the GOP. Is that uh, <laughs> what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think it's not on the election, but I think the key was the re-election yeah. of, of Barack Obama. Right? It wasn't a fluke. And that they're here. And, and what's notable is that two things happened at the same time. Uh, one is uh, our, the election and re-election of our first African-American president. So this symbolic projection of how the country's changing. And, and those were actually the same years that the country went from, demographically speaking, being a majority white Christian country. We were 54 percent white and Christian at the beginning of his presidency. And when he left, um, we were 47% white and Christian. Today, we're wow. 42. Wow. Um, so wow. I, I think this demographic shift, Demographics along with are the destiny. symbolic thing, that's yeah. really what uh, really blew Robert, it up. Robert Jones, author of the new book, The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future.